Thank you. I want to also note that I'm joining you all today from Watertown, Massachusetts, which is the original land of Nonantum and Massachusetts First Nations peoples. We recognize their work as original stewards of this land, and we recognize the continued colonial violence that uh, maintains a heavy colonial legacy. I will also note that I am of Haitian descent and the past few weeks have been difficult, the past few months have been difficult with Haiti on the heart, um, considering the devastation that we've experienced regarding the earthquake, um, the presidential assassination, most recently the deportations in the United States. And I want to point out that I feel very strongly that the work that I do about religion is also political. Um, because black spirits matter as much as black lives. So with that, I will note that this work features a chapter from my book, which is called Art of the Healing Gods, Illness, Imbalance, and Sacred Arts of the Black Atlantic, a comparative religious art study that centers on Haiti and the Democratic Republic of Congo. My work investigates how sacred art objects mediate relationships between humans and spirits in contemporary Caribbean and Central African healing ceremonies. Situated at the intersection of art history and religious studies, my research employs an interdisciplinary approach, weaving together the fields of material culture and sacred arts, ethnography of healing, and comparative Africana religions to analyze spiritual illness and healing art objects in Haiti and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Haiti and DR Congo provide sound parallels as they are directly linked by legacies of the transatlantic slave trade, resulting in a matrix of interconnection. By comparatively examining Haitian and Congolese sacred healing art implements, I demonstrate the powerful resonances and particularities of two Africana religions in which the ritual arts expand our categories of human, object, and spiritual being. I've chosen three quotes to frame my talk today. And those who know me might laugh because usually I have two quotes today, I have three, I'm feeling abundant. The first quote is by the esteemed uh, Charles H. Long, a scholar and historian of religion who states that a vital religious life will tend to express itself in artistic forms. Art thus seems to be a necessary dimension of religion. In art forms, the relationship of human to his world, her world is objectified and made complete. The second set of quotes are, uh, first is a Kikongo proverb, Kumpemba kwa tequila wa waku ukudila mvutu. Arimpemba, which is the ancestral realm, is one of yours who will assist you in time of trouble. And the second is by a Congolese scholar of religion, Gérald Tulu Kiam Pansu Buakasa, states, en plus de pouvoir, un inquisi est comme un homme. Il sait, il voit, donc il vit. In addition to its power, an Nkisi is like a human. It knows, it sees, thus it lives. My book offers a methodological intervention in art history and Africana religious studies by demonstrating that the study of ritual healing arts requires combining art historians' ethnographic study sorry, art historians' visual and material culture analysis with anthropologists' ethnographic study of religious healing traditions. My object-centered approach focuses on four kinds of artifacts used in ritual ceremonies. One, ritual rattles, two, mystic pots, three, sacred bundles, and four, divine mirrors. My principal research questions examine how does the aesthetic functioning and fashioning of ritual art objects create direct channels of communication and exchange with the spirit world? How do sacred objects restore balance and equilibrium to the lives of clients who are facing physical illness, psychological disorder, and or social affliction? And finally, as few art objects work alone, how does the collective use of sacred arts enhance the efficacy of religious healing ceremonies? We know that when the body is ridden with sickness, we seek medical treatment. What happens, however, when the spirit is ill or imbalanced? Black Atlantic's healers explain that a spiritual illness emerges from spiritual imbalances that can affect one's physical body, social well being, and mental health. Ritual treatment often includes medicinal plants, skilled social mediation, 
and sacred art objects used as healing implements and initiation emblems. My findings are based on visual analysis of the art objects, as well as fieldwork conducted between 2014 and 2015 in Mille and in Jacmel in Haiti. So I work primarily in the south in Jacmel and then in the central plateau in Mille And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I work primarily in the city of Kikwit. It becomes clear how Africana art objects invoke spirits, ward off negative energy, address spiritual and physical ailments, and protect individuals and the community. This emphasis on the ritual work of sacred arts, rather than regarding them as passive objects, reveals these art forms as active ritual participants in ceremony. In today's talk, I focus on Congolese mirrors, ditenshi, or kitalatala. I examine the ritual inclusion of mirrors in divination rites which provide counsel for diviners and clients by serving as direct conduits to ancestral spirits, known in Kikongo as bankaka. As art objects included in Minkisi, mirrors offer sight into the invisible world and provide healing through mystic packs with the spirits. Analyzing one particular healing ceremony conducted by Banganga Ngombo, who are indigenous priestesses and diviners, Mama Mali Kimbo Malobo and Mama Sumbo Kita, I introduced divination as the art of seeing and discerning to develop mystic vision into the invisible realm of the ancestors. I begin by analyzing mirrors as symbolic of sacred waters and a residence or mythic geography of spirits and ancestors who live in a realm known as Kalunga. Secondly, as refractors of positive energy and refractors of negative energy, mirrors feature prominently in many minkisi or sacred objects. And these mirrored minkisi, as I call them, serve as mystic eyes and concealers of medicine. This chapter reveals how mirrors and reflective surfaces render the spirit world more accessible when employed by diviners trained in spiritual sight. Ultimately, I consider how mirrors as divination art signal the omnipresence of ancestral spirits. Furthermore, mirrors remind us of the importance of sustaining communication between visible and invisible worlds as different ways of intuiting knowledge from the ancestral realm. So I'll begin with a story. Glass portals. Mama Mali Malobo, featured here on the right, is a diviner with a grand presence and a shy smile. The Nganga Ngombo, diviner and priestess, wears a marvelous head wrap today. The first time that I've seen her wrap it so deliberately and so formally. While we are seated, Mama Malobo steps just outside the door and makes a phone call to Mama Sumbu. Oh, moi je pensais que elles étaient les ennemis. Oh, I thought they were enemies, I exclaim. Papa Stev, my translator, smiles coyly in that mischievous way of his. Non, peut-être elles se sont séparées après un temps. Peut-être une a travaillé avec l'autre et maintenant elles travaillent dans leur propre coin, bien qu'elles pourraient travailler ensemble. You know, perhaps they separated after a certain time. Maybe one of them worked with the other, was even initiated with the other. And now they work in their own corners, though at times they may work together. The Women's Healer Alliance surprises me and makes me smile as I had heard of their ongoing rivalry. Soon, I am delighted to see Mama Sumbu walk in the door, shake our hands and seat herself next to her collaborator. Mama Sumbu on the left-hand side is a petite woman, yet sturdily built with a husky voice and a slight rasp, which may make her seem more gruff than she actually is. At Mama Malobo's feet sits her young apprentice in the center, a girl of about 12 years old with bright, curious eyes. As we situate ourselves, Mama Malobo pulls out several instruments to begin the ceremony, starting with a blue pitcher of Malafuya Ngashi, palm wine, and an unopened pack of cigarettes, along with a box of matches. In another trip, she brings out a pocket-sized mirror, Titenshi, and two noisemakers, a small metal bell, Ngunga, which Mama Sumbu takes charge of, and a plastic talcum container that rattles, Kisangu, which Mama Malobo uses herself as the rhythm keeper during the ceremony. Each noisemaker is hoisted in the air by its respective priestess, and the mirror sits next to the small hole in the center of the floor. The hole had been pointed out to us in earlier visits as the home of the Bankaka, the ancestors and spirits. Several visits later, Mama Malobo would explain that this opening in the center 
of her concrete floor, no larger than the one's inner palm, is her own nzunguyan dotu, her own sacred vessel used to feed the ancestors in ritual. The ceremony commences silently with the pouring of palm wine into the nzunguya bankaka to awaken the ancestral spirits. Before proceeding, Mama Malobo asks the patient for his diwuka, his ritual payment for the divination. He hands her 3,000 franc congolais, about three US dollars. And after touching the body uh, of the client to the money to connect the diwuka with his own energy, she places the money between the two healers underneath the pocket-sized mirror. I'll note here that diteshi is the word for mirror in Kikongo, but the word for, ki, uh, the word for mirror in Lingala is kitala tala. Kutala means to look. So literally, kitala tala is to look, look. Mama Malobo pours palm wine over the mirror and makes a witty remark. The ancestors are greedy today, as the palm wine in the Nzungu is fast diminishing and the spirits have not yet had their fill. The two priestesses and the apprentice begin harmonizing together in a Kimbala song the language of the ancestors. The way their voices intertwine, it sounds as if three additional women have joined their chorus. The resonance is powerful and so moving. I think that I could live in this pocket of time and revisit the experience for the rest of my life. The patient is a man with long fingers and expressive hands. He begins to fidget while the women sing and it occurs to me that he does not conceal anxiety very well. After two or three song refrains, Mama Malobo pauses and asks the patient whether this sounds familiar. The ancestors have spoken through the mirror and she interprets their message. This pain of yours, I see where it is coming from. The ancestors tell me that the family has split. The patient acknowledges there is trouble in his lineage involving a rift between two family factions. On his father's side, three of his uncles had each assumed leadership as Nfumu, clan chieftain. And within a short time, each one had mysteriously died. The patient now remains the only able-bodied man in his family. The diviners explain that he must step up and take responsibility for his family's livelihood. The patient sighs heavily, knowingly, confirming what Mama Malubo has reported. The deterioration of family ties had occurred because of kindoki, negative energy sent by someone intending to cause harm. The patient explains that he is here to determine who had tried to destroy his family and what could be done about the chieftainship. Mama Malobo nods, pours more palm wine into the Nzungu Yantoto and onto the mirror. And with the metal bell and plastic rattle still poised in their hands, she and Mama Sumbu began singing the responses of the ancestors again. In between songs, Mama Malobo occasionally lifts the mirror's edge, tilts it, and watches the palm wine form puddles on its surface. The mirror winks in the sunlight, and with new knowledge, Mama Malobo looks up and continues her divine counsel. The world behind the mirror. In southwestern Congo, there is a long-standing tradition of communication with the spirits through the use of mirrors and reflective surfaces. Among indigenous priestesses known as Banganga Ngombo, mirrors transmit messages between the visible world of humans and the invisible world of spirits. When anointed by palm wine, Malafu Yangashi, the ancestor's chosen beverage, the mirror becomes a pair of otherworldly eyes. With a heightened sense of intuition, healers and diviners convey knowledge otherwise imperceptible to human senses of this world. In many religious communities, mirrors serve as divination tools, reflectors of positive light, refractors, refractors of negative energy, and can also embody the spirits themselves. For devotees, mirrors reflective surface remains a point of access between the visible world and the living dead. And I'll note here that in Haitian Voodoo, Maya Darren, an ethnographer and priestess of the tradition, notes that mirrors serve as a metaphor for the spiritual realm, and they also serve as a crossroads between worlds. This afterlife serves as ancestral home will all elders eventually return, and from where all infants ultimately emerge. We must first recognize that water's surface likely served as humans' first encounter with mirrors. Indeed, African and African diasporic sacred arts often portray river and sea spirits as connected to mirrors depicting worlds on the other side. 
Religion scholar James Fernandez explains, quote, the reversal of an otherwise identical representation, what is called the enantiomorphic effect, has been suggestive as a metaphor for the condition of the dead, particularly in societies which emphasize their continuity and similarity with the living, end quote. Describing the spiritual world of historical Congo, Kim Wandende, Bunseki Fukiao, Simon Mboki, and Wyatt McGathy all explain that the Congolese spirit realm of Kalunga served as the world of spirits, ancestors, and the unborn, and was a reversed reality of the material world. Just as a mirror reveals what appears to be the opposite, you raise your right arm, the reflection raises its left, the realm of spirits mimics the world of mortals, witnessing one action and performing the inverse. I argue that Kalunga might be best understood as a mythic geography, similar to Cuban Palero's ancestral world of Kalunga, as well as the realm of Afrique Guinée for Haitian Vaudouisant. In the cases of both the Congolese and Cuban Kalunga and Haiti's Afrique Guinée, the locus of origin is not simply one of birth, but of birthright, death, and ritual center. Today in Kikwit, healers agree that there are several residences of the spirits, referred to in French as le monde invisible, including below the earth where the ancestors reside, in Kikongo Inchi Abafwa, or world of the dead. There are also river spirits known as Basimbi in Lingala or Bisimbi in Kikongo, sometimes also referred to as La Sirene, who are connected to watery ancestral worlds. And I'll note here that this is really fascinating because while the term Basimbi was used to refer to all spirits of nature or Bankita, the term Simbi has been remembered as a very specific spirit in Haitian Vodou. And the spirit, like in ancient Congo, is recognized as a spirit associated with rivers, rain, magic, healing, and initiation. Art historian Barbaro Martinez Ruiz describes how Bisimbi spirits are manifestations of the universal power of Kalunga, or the materialization of the power of God. Certain healers in Kikwit, such as Mama Sumbu, explain that these river spirits can capture a person and take them below the river in an underwater realm known as Elima Yamasa, world of water. Here initiations may take place with ritual instruction of medicinal plants and ceremony from the spirits. Relatedly in Haiti, certain Unga and Mambo priests and priestesses report traveling underneath the water, en badlu, for priestly training which explains how they have learned Vodou rhythms, salutations, dances, and ritual knowledge bases without formal community initiation. As we know, the Democratic, or maybe we don't know, but the Democratic Republic of Congo possesses only a small outlet to the Atlantic Ocean, and in many ways, it is really a nation of rivers. Situated at the mouth of the Quilu and Quango rivers, the city of Kikwit centers around river culture. And river spirits seem to inhabit a world with different governing principles than this one. Also with regards to time and space, the manner in which the ancestors live seems to be an inverted form. Basimi are especially active during rainfall. And as such, certain healing ceremonies cannot take place on a day that has rained or on a night that was preceded by rain. As the river spirits, la sirene, hold fast to those who are spiritually vulnerable including patients. The spirits known as Mamiwata and Tatawata rarely leave their river home, but when they do, it is when they have found someone who has devoted herself or himself as the spirit's lover in exchange for material wealth. These chosen lovers exhibit strange behavior, speaking as if to a partner when no one else is present. If not cautious, one can be taken captive and brought to live beneath the river for eternity. Perhaps this is why mirrors communicate so effectively with the ancestors through divination. Basimbi spirits may recognize the mirror of water as a translation of human messages into their own language of reflections and reflected images. In ancient Congo, initiates training for the priesthood, such as in Gangangombo in the 20th century, 19th century, and possibly 18th century, were presented with a mirror and a set of bones. Initiates were asked to use the mirror to describe the features of the bone's original owner. These remains would have belonged to the spirits of people whom initiates could not have known as they had long since journeyed to the spirit realm. Among Mbidi Witi nations of Equatorial Guinea, 
Initiates participate in vision quests after they ingest the hallucinogenic plant known as Iboga and are presented with mirrors in which they must perceive the face of an ancestral figure. Today in Kikwit, diviners and priestesses, or Banganga Ngombo, who are usually women, I'll note, rely upon mirrors to identify a client's condition, diagnose the disorder or imbalance, and finally issue a remedy. The ancestors relay their divination responses through rhythmic song, including coded lyrics only accessible to initiated devotees whose senses of sight and sound have been awakened to perceive messages from invisible spirits and ancestral speakers. Interestingly, Mama Malobo has explained that in her own ritual work, the mirror itself relays the messages of the invoked ancestors. This presents a fascinating meditation on the purpose of mirrors to both reflect and refract, to connect and even correct as we adjust ourselves accordingly when examining our reflection. What happens, however, when mirror gazing permits a diviner to see not only a reflection of self, but to perceive one's ancestral lineage? Members of one's lineage depicted or housed in the mirror, in this sense, become the real diviners of ceremony. Such sacred art objects and divination mirrors especially embody what Kimberly Patton has called a divine reflexivity in their enactment of ritual and their relational exchange with humans and spirits. In this way, mirrors and water reflect the self and also extensions of the self, which have been inverted in spiritual form. Thus, these simultaneous encounters with oneself and ancestor, ancestral other grants Congolese citizens access to multiple generations through the mirror. Such familiar or unfamiliar faces peer back knowingly at mirror gazers, witnessing the unfolding of their descendants' lives across eras of ritual time. Minkisi, beyond the nail fetish. Undoubtedly, the most recognized face of Minkisi in the Western world is Minkisi Nkondi. In many Minkisi Nkondi, though by no means all of them, the surface is overlaid with nails set into the structure. Wyatt McGaffey provides extensive discussion of Nkisi Nkondi's work as a ritual hunter, though I argue that Nkisi Nkondi is more aptly described as a justice seeker rather than a senseless murderer. Um, and Nkisi's nails indicate the resolve of the Nganga and the spirits to address a specific problem at hand. I want to point out that this particular Nkisi Nkondi is in the form of a dog and is often referred to as a Janus face, or I would say a Legba face, meaning that it has two heads or two faces. Um, the reason that a dog has been chosen is because dogs are regarded as mediators between visible and invisible realms. The understanding is that the reason that dogs will howl at night when seemingly nobody else is around is because they're seeing things that humans cannot see. So you can tell your dogs that the dog lovers might appreciate that. Okay, continuing. Roughly translating uh, Nkisi and Kondi, it means sacred medicine of the hunter, from the Kikongo verb kukonda to hunt, and Nkisi, sacred medicine. In this case, Nkisi and Kondi engages in matters of judicial affairs and oath swearing. Each nail represents a troubling difficulty and signifies an oath taken by the Nkisi to accomplish the feat that it has been contracted to perform. A brief historiography of Minkisi and Kondi reveal their debatable origins as a purely indigenous Congo sacred art form, but rather one greatly influenced by European material culture. Indeed, many Catholic religious objects became repurposed with Congo cultural contexts. Trade goods added complexity and novelty to traditional Minkisi, such as the use of iron nails and fish hooks as early as the mid 16th or mid 17th century. So what served as the visual inspiration for Nkisi and Kondi? Catholic missionaries' importation of heart-pierced Madonnas and bleeding Jesus Christ crucifixes quite possibly inspired the incorporation of blades and nails in Nkisi and Kondi, even as they were reinterpreted in a Congo religious context. The irony thus does not escape us in pointing out that Congo nail populated art of the 16th or 17th centuries likely emerged following the introduction of Catholic crucifixes of the colonial era. So this is really fascinating in part because most people see the Minkisi and Kondi as a really typical example of a fetish object or a power object. And in fact, there are several scholars um, who suggest actually these nails may have been incorporated because of this inspiration from Catholic iconography that included nails in the crucifix. 
to understand why Minkisi statues with nails outnumber other styles of Minkisi in Western museum collections, we must understand how Minkisi came to represent the typical Minkisi. As evidence from Wyatt McGaffey's extensive detail of over 45 Minkisi varieties, Minkisi with knots and mirrors are arguably more common than those with nails inserted into them. Minkisis form as bundles, as packed shells, as filled ceramic pots, far outnumber anthropomorphic or zoomorphic statues that are so valued in Western museums. This suggests a curious development in Minkisi categorization, one that reveals more about the biases of collection histories and art history than it does about Congo sacred arts themselves. McGaffey suggests the origins for this bias, noting, quote, since pots lack the visual appeal of sculptures, collectors ignored them and few are now available for inspection in museums, end quote. Indeed, it appears that European and American museums have become fixated on the Inkisi and Kondi as the iconic, quote, nail fetish and exotic face of African art. Minkisi and Kondi are rarely, if ever, depicted as representations of religious retribution and healing. In this way, the overemphasis on nail-centered Minkisi and Kondi in museum collections and the scholarly literature may more accurately reflect Western imaginaries of the African fetish. Recognizing the influence of European crucifix and bleeding heart iconography on Central African Minkisi and Kondi, we must re-examine the archives of these so-called primitive religious arts in a cross-cultural framework. Undoubtedly, Minkisi and Kondi received the greatest attention in Western art collections, despite representing only a fraction of all Minkisi. One could easily argue that there are just as many Minkisi adorned with mirrors as there are hunter Minkisi with nails. Mirrored Minkisi, or Minkisi di Tenshi, as I call them, do not all fall within discrete categories of either healing or justice vessels, as many blend these spiritual powers in their mystic work for clients. Mirrored Minkisi, flash of the ancestral spirits. If mirrors function as spirit realms and portals of entry into otherworldly dimensions, their flash of light ought to be understood as powerful occurrences of transcendence, of worlds meeting worlds. Equated with supernatural sight, mirrors have long been associated with the eyes. A French proverb indicates, les yeux sont le miroir de l'âme. The eyes are the mirror of the soul. Indeed, one's eyes offer such intimate portraits of selfhood that a person's true intentions can be unknowingly revealed. This extends to spirit portrayals as well. Several sacred art traditions depict spirits' eyes as mirrors. Art historian Suzanne Blier considers Benin Boccio sculptures adorned with mirrors that resolve conflict as having the power both to attract and dispel energy, both in seeing danger and in turning it back. Oh no, we'll stick with the Boccio for a moment longer. Historically, Congolese mirrored Minkisi likely emerged from the Banganga's divination rites with reflective surfaces. Such glass fragments empower statue Minkisi animated by a nature spirit or an ancestral spirit. As a reservoir of spiritual power, these mirrors act as watchful eyes and counter the forces of negative energies known as kindoki. Such eyes see clearly not only things that take place in the physical world, but also provide vision into the spiritual realm. Especially in anthropomorphic Minkisi or Bankisi statues, one often notes small glass shards polished and placed in the center of the stomach, protecting and concealing sacred medicines that activate the ritual art object. When positioned as the Inkisi's eyes, mirrors allow the figure to perform work in this world with greater insight and clarity. Wyatt McGaffey reflects, quote, the eyes of many Minkisi take the form of mirrors fixed on their bodies, which enable a diviner to see the direction from which the danger comes, end quote. The presence of mirrors embedded within these various ritual art objects provides a momentary glimpse into the world of unseen entities, invoking what Robert Ferris Thompson has so aptly called a flash of the spirit. In their original configuration, Minkisi's mirrors allowed Banganga and Gombo to foresee any threatening dangers and to act accordingly. In this way, mirrored Minkisi and standalone divination mirrors serve as tools for the priest or priestess's mystic vision to arrest calamity and deflect harmful energy of harmdoers. When Nkisi's eyes are fashioned from mirrors, the statue imitates an Nganga Ngombo, a divining priestess's supernatural sight. 
This unique inkisi, which is the flyer for our presentation tonight, wears a skirt of leather hide with the fur still attached in some places. The inkisi wears a small hat resembling a red mpu, a raffia hat, which could indicate that this figure is a chief, an nfumu. A stomach mirror forms the figure's entire torso and no arms are visible, only a slender neck attached to the head. The Nkisi's lips are sealed, perhaps having taken an oath of silence, and bright gleaming eyes represent mesumia kintungunu, kintungununu, or questioning, argumentative eyes. Judging from the red cap and unopened mouth, this Nkisi might represent the silent yet powerful chief Nfumu, ever watchful and judicious, and whose royal couriers deliver messages on his behalf. A last example of Nkisi in Ditenshi, a mirrored Nkisi, portrays a powerful ritual worker adorned with sacred healing implements to harness the powers of nature. Nkisi Ankiduku protects people in war and controls the rain, as downpours can prevent battles from proceeding, especially if firearms are utilized. This rainmaker Nkisi invokes wet weather in two ways, through its dark colored cloak associated with heavy rain clouds and also with snail shells from the river. As Barbaro Martinez Ruiz explains, the snail shell serves as an emblem of fresh water, one of nature's vital forces, Simbiki Amasa. A miniature dried calabash, which we can see here on the right-hand side, covered in white pigment, likely in Pemba kaolin clay, suggests that this Nkisi is an Nganga, a priest or priestess equipped with a ritual rattle to invoke the ancestors in song. A small dried seed pod rattle for protection has been painted red and white, contrasting sacred colors of vital life force and the ancestral world. Knotted fabric and raffia cords bind the figure's legs, perhaps to prevent heavy rains from falling. Nkisi ya Nkiduku also features a fascinating parallel with the mirrored black, red, and white medicine bundles above and below the Nkisi's face. Over the stomach, a protrusion of medicines appears in black fabric. A thin red oval encircles the bundle, which is in turn surrounded by a thicker white oval. These circles were likely made with white kaolin clay and red clay, maybe camwood or sandstone, invoking masculine for white and feminine for red divine energies. Though there is no mirror positioned on the stomach, the white and red circles frame a black oval at center, creating a sort of phantom mirror. These circles also resemble the white circles painted around the Banganga's eyes to enhance their mystic vision. Moving up to the Nkisi's crowning headpiece, a small ditenshi, or nfudi in this case, mirror, has been placed at the center, encircled again with red and white pigments. Martinez Ruiz identifies these three enclosures here at the top and where the stomach's medicine bundle and phantom mirrors stand, that the headdress's physical mirror and medicine bundle extend outward to form a horizontal oval. In its original purpose, the mirror would detect which way warriors might become vulnerable in times of war. The mirror's placement here enhances the figure's powers of sight with the metaphysical eye, identified as the third eye in Hindu chakra systems. Nkisi Nkiduku's mirrored medicines that crown the Nganga's head provide mystic vision into the invisible realm demonstrating that this Nkisi does not operate simply as a ritual device, but as a personified divination implement. The figure's ceremonial garb, elaborate headdress, and bundle of sacred tools further signify that this priest, that this figure is a priest, a healer, a diviner. The gathering of multiple implements for an Nkisi sacred assemblage thus produces a ritual decadence to signal its unbridled power as a healer who instigates change in the natural world. Nkunguya Bankaka, Song of the Ancestors. I'm going to play a very short clip of the song so you all can hear the singing. <laughs> In 
their last song, the women's stirring harmony returns. Mama Sungu keeps a steady rhythm with the bell, and Mama Malobo's rattle maintains a swift tempo. All the while, Mama Malobo continues to adjust the mirror, tipping the reflective glass from side to side and pouring more palm wine into the Mzumbuya Antoki. The patient's loss of three uncles and his near loss of his only remaining brother had disturbed him profoundly and ignited a fire in him to restore justice to his family. Seeking Mama Malobo's expertise and guidance, he hoped that the divination ceremony known as Kutempa would yield concrete answers to the spiritual imbalance caused by Kindoki and provide a solution for the unresolved conflict. In this sense, divine mirrors play a key role in restoring order, balance, and rhythm to the world by determining the how of a particular illness, death, or catastrophe. Through the ritual act of divining, Banganga and Gombo help mediate an individual's experience of pain, their agitated states of grief, mourning, and even their desire for retribution and revenge. After the patient has inquired about the ritual remedy and also paid a bit more for payment, Mama Malobo details what must be done. She explains that the angered family member and offender has sent une foudre, une zashi, a powerful negative energy stationed in his house. Three things are needed to disrupt the spell. Two require the diviner's involvement. The third will be the patient's own responsibility. Mama Malobo and Mama Sumbu must first begin by making a visit to his home in the village to cleanse the space and destroy the destructive force. Secondly, the priestesses will erect a protective spiritual barrier around him so that he cannot be harmed by future attacks. The third task requires family consensus. The family feud emerged because of a disagreement as to who would become the next Nfumu, the next clan chieftain. When the family finally decided to split, the first family chose their chieftain and introduced him to the community as per ritual custom dictates. The patient side of the family never presented any of the three chosen uncles as the new chieftain. Their misfortune was partially due to this neglect of community rights. Moving forward then, the patient's task would be to officially announce their chosen leader. And along with the other ritual steps, all would be resolved. Later, I asked about the subject of the healer's song, wondering whether it was a common song used to open the barrier between visible and invisible worlds. The, Bambang, the Banganga and Gombo smiled and shook their head, no. They explained that the song directly channels the voice of the patient's own Bankaka, as well as Mama Malobo's ancestors, and that the Kimbala song lyrics, which we just heard, contain the results of the divination. Early verses describe the patient's problem and provide diagnosis, identifying whether the problem is an individual matter or one from previous generations. Later verses provide the ritual remedy. Ntangu beto ye kimba, yoke tubila, beto makambo ya muntu me kwisatiyo. When we sing, they tell us the problems of the person who arrives. The priestesses had known neither the rhythm of the song before the ceremony, nor the lyrics of the refrain. The mirror glinted quietly at their feet, and it occurs to me that I could have never anticipated this answer. The palm wine has been finished, and Mama Sumbu collects the sacred implements as Mama Malobo stands to escort the patient out. The young girl apprentice turns the mirror over so that its reflective surface touches the cool concrete floor and its matte black finish stares up at the ceiling. Her motion is simply made, without flourish, but with fixed attention, adjusting the mirror as if carefully hanging up a long distance phone call. Conclusion. The mirror that sees and knows. The act of divination is rarely as simple as fortune telling. In such sessions, clients can voice concerns about specific difficulties and freely express dreams and longings that otherwise may never be spoken aloud. With ancestral insight, diviners advise their clients and encourage them to gain greater command over their lives. Often, indigenous healing rituals provide another component of diagnosis left unexplained by Western medicine. Gaston Mwenembatende maintains that these existential anxieties may be best addressed through ritual healing traditions because they express a universal human yearning to know not simply what, has caused harm, but why and how? Indeed, it's critical that we regard certain ritual arts and divination rites as part of Africana cultural philosophies that seek the counsel of ritual specialists, spirits, and the ancestors. Most Black Atlantic healers and priests explain that unless ancestral spirits are invoked through the use of ritual art objects, rattles, bundles, pots, and mirrors, the medicinal plants used in healing treatments treatments cannot be effective. 
In my analyses of healing rituals, I argue that sacred art objects synchronize with one another, exponentially enhancing the other's ritual power. As the Vodou proverb states, one plus one equals three. I argue that examining art objects as religious subjects provides insight into how Haitian and Congolese religious communities relate to sacred art objects, neither as inanimate things nor as fetishes. Rather, these art objects serve as sacred entities and integral elements of ritual treatment designed to heal patients holistically. I demonstrate how religious artifacts yield immense power as ritual remedies, and as such, these sacred objects become the arts that heal disorder, imbalance, and misfortune. These indigenous philosophies illuminate how a sacred art object maintains its essence, a pot remains pot-like, a mirror retains its mirrorness, while also adopting the selfhood of visiting spirits. These healing treatments signal a ritualized collaboration and integration, integration of people, spirits, and objects, especially in the context of ceremony. This allows us to move away from historical terms such as fetish and power object. Drawing from the work of research participants and ritual elders, the use of more local terms and theoretical concepts such as minkisi reveals the limitless status of ritual arts as divine beings somewhere along the spectrum of person, object, and spirit. Ultimately, this project seeks to expand definitions of object, art, and medicine to propose what I identify as the blurred genre of ritual healing arts. So finally, mirrors serve as hosts to both the familiar and the strange. Congolese mirrors and Black Atlantic mirrors more generally serve as portals to the invisible world, as divine mediators between realms and as prophetic ritual objects that foretell news of death and return. Religious communities all over the world perform similar rites of divination to prepare themselves for transition and passage and to navigate the earthly world that they inhabit with insight from other realms. In this way, divinatory mirrors serve as respectful ritual salutes to the spirits and the dead. Such insights reveal the respectful creative approaches that Congolese devotees undertake to communicate with the divine, which remains eternally present, and to pay ritual tribute to the ancestors whom they eventually will become. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Daniels. Everyone, I'm sure, is excited to, um, to cheer, to give you a round of applause, whether virtually or with our hands. It was a wonderful lecture. And um, it was so, for me, um, as somebody who's been following your work for the past few years, it's really wonderful to see how you've really kind of crystallized what is at the core of your work, this, um, the focus on how objects can bring together the human and spiritual world. Um, and to think about how these objects, I think, are very, um, have very rich and layered meaning. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that came to my mind as we were hearing about this is that relationship between mirrors and water. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that the Congo has a very small shoreline, but has all of these rivers. And I just found that connection between topography and rituals and sacred arts um, to be very, um, it's striking, I think in part because I'm thinking about connections between topography and arts in other places. Um, but I was just wondering if you could maybe expand on that a little bit. And also, do you find this connection between topography and um, sacred arts and rituals in other places that you're studying too? Is that something that you've seen as kind of coming out as a theme? That's such a wonderful question. And thank you so much, Dr. Leone. Of course, I'm thinking of your class on Venice and thinking about the arts and religious arts that are reflective of the environment in which they are created. And I think you're absolutely right to point out that there is a connection between the environment and the spirits that inhabit that space. So for instance, um, in ancient Congo and to a certain extent still today, uh, spirits typically inhabited two residences. Basimbi either lived in water, usually rivers, but sometimes the ocean, or they lived on land in the forest. And what's fascinating, I mentioned earlier that Basimbi has been remembered in Haiti, and it's a very unique spirit because typically spirits in Haiti are associated either with water or more with fire. And Simbi is both. 
Simi mm -hmm. in Haiti is associated with rivers and with rain, but is also associated with medicinal plants used in healing. And I think that that's a direct remembrance from ancient Congo of the fact that there were some Simbi of water and some Simbi of the land. And I would say, you know, regarding the ritual artifacts, I think to a certain extent, you see reflections of the environment. I mean, we can think about the fact, for instance, that leather is used here in this case with the Nkisi um, that has a mirror and that has this leather skirt. Um, so there are certain ways that you see it, but I think that you see it a lot in um, other components of religious experience. So for instance, in Haiti, you have certain ritual taboos when you initiate as a priest or as a healer that you cannot eat fresh water in Jacmel freshwater fish, excuse me, in Jack Mel. Now, that's not so difficult to do for a coastal region, right? We can imagine that that makes sense as a ritual taboo, but that's not necessarily going to be the case, I think, in the mountain valley where I do research in Mio Valley, where you don't encounter ritual taboos of the river because the river is such an essential source of life. So I think you see it both in the sacred arts, you know, this environmental uh, influence in how the sacred arts are crafted, but also in the religious cultural experiences. Fascinating. Thank you so much for elaborating sure. on that. Um, we have a question from one of our um, participants. To Wonderful. Chorzy. This is one of my students. Chomsky, okay. how are you? Thank you for coming. Uh, of course. Hi, everybody. My name is Chomsky Eugene. I'm one of Dr. Daniel's students in her When Gods Begin Again class. And my question, I typed it in the chat, um, but I was really interested in your correlation between objects and divination and um, ceremony specifically. And it kind of made me think about how um, today the objects that we use primarily are around technology and how that is such a huge aspect of our um, world today, but also in reference to history and the things that our peoples have experienced um, as a result of the things that you're talking about, which is why they started these ceremonies. My question is how do you um, bring a lot of those practices and rituals into a contemporary, modern, and constantly advancing world? Oh, that's a fantastic question, Chosky. Gold star for you. Um, I want to point out that I'm really appreciative you use the term technology in particular, because there are a lot of ways that we can see these divination techniques as religious technologies, as ritual technologies. Technology is a manner of doing something. It is a system that one does something. And so divination, which is ancient all over the world, you have divination in China, divination in Iraq, divination in Peru, divination in Nigeria, divination in Haiti, right? All of these forms are in fact, I think, a ritual technology. What we use today are these digital technologies. And I think you're finding some fascinating uh, ways in which these technologies of divination are being updated for the 21st century. So I'll give you two brief examples. Um, one is that, you know, the power of Zoom, things have become transformed. And so people now will conduct readings and divinations online. That's something that you can do with a, a trusted client and a trusted diviner. Um, there are certain people who are less reputable that I would say, but I think that that's something that you're seeing not only in the United States, but also in places like Nigeria, Cuba, and Haiti. So I think that that's a fascinating way that divination has been keeping up, if you will. I'll also note that um, regarding some of the sacred implements that are used in this divination healing ceremony, I mentioned the use of the mirror, I mentioned the bell. I also mentioned a ritual rattle. Now, the original ritual rattle that Mama Malobo used was much like the one that we saw in the Nkisi. It was a small calabash gourd. And she explained that she found all of these ritual implements in the cemetery. The spirits had sent her to the cemetery. And these are the same things. I know that um, Professor Ross Michael Brown is here. I'm sure that he's familiar with this. In ancient Congo, you see the same sorts of ritual narratives that diviners are describing. The spirit sent me to find, it's, I call them found sacred arts. The spirits guide you to the crossroads or they guide you to the river and there you will find your sacred implements. And so we imagine that this is a network established between healers, right? So somebody is getting initiated and so it's okay, we make sure that this junior who's getting initiated is going to find this at this place and at this time, right? That's how we might rationalize it in this sense. But there's some creativity involved because Mama Malobo's calabash rattle eventually broke, it disintegrated. And so she got a talcum powder box that was used for pills once upon a time that she got at like the clinic down the street from her. And she put seeds and stones inside of it. And so this little medicine pill is now serving as a sacred medicine and a ritual rattle. And I think that that's just a wonderful example of the ways that these technologies are being reinvented, but the meaning 
meaning and the essence is staying the same. So thank you so much for that question, Shosky. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat from Emine Fefachu. And she says, thank you for this excellent talk. Could you tell us about Congolese or Haitian theories of vision and understandings of how vision works and whether mirrors have any place in that? You mentioned the saying, the eyes are the mirrors of the soul, but I was wondering about concepts of how vision mechanically works and if the metaphor of the mirror has any place in that. Thank you so much, Professor Fitvachi. I'm so glad to have you joining us. And I am excited that you use the word mechanics of sight. That's actually a section that I've been working on in a revision of this chapter. So you must have intuited that from the other side. Um, regarding the mechanics of sight, I think that there is something very profound about diviners all over the world because divination, and this is something I'm really interested in thinking about more, is really about a, a cultivating of the powers that are mortal in the sensory world a cultivating of the powers of sight and sound to perceive things from the invisible world. And what do I mean by that? So literally, the eyes are enhanced with mystic vision when healers from ancient Congo and still today to a certain extent would use kaolin clay, which is a sacred malleable clay found in riverbeds, they would paint their faces, but specifically their eyes to enhance their vision in ceremony. And the understanding is that white being associated with the ancestral realm and coming from the sacred river where the spirits reside would allow them to see into the other realm. And so when they would perform ritual divination with once upon a time what was bowls of water and now which has become mirrors coming from 16th century venetian mirrors actually i might add dr leone now you have this sense that the white cow and clay may no longer be needed because their initiation is taking the place of that enhancement of sight and the powers of sound are really important as well here because there's an understanding that when becoming initiated, you are able to hear things that are coming from the other world. So this comes up in the example that I was giving of the Nkunga, the song that was sung. It said that every song is distinct. So there are certain patterns of problems that people encounter, but the specificities are supposed to come from the ancestors themselves. And so you have to be able to discern what the ancestors are saying to bring that song into being and to describe the patient's problem. And they will confirm it. You know, people say, well, do these things really work? They wouldn't have payment systems, you know, if these systems didn't work. So the clients establish this relationship of trust with the diviner that is demonstrated as to whether they've gotten the story right. And if they have, even if there are certain adjustments that they may make or nuances they may add, um, that really establishes a strong sense of trust in terms of their powers of sight and sound into the other world. Thank you. I was really struck how um, how you talked about different senses being engaged in these rituals. Um, great. We have another question from um, Professor Aurelia Campbell. Um, fascinating talk. I would like to know whether the Minkisi or other ritual objects such as mirrors are used in burials in addition to the healing and funerary rituals. If so, do you have any sense of how they're intended to function in the afterlife? That's a wonderful question. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Campbell, especially while you are on leave. Um, I think that this is a really powerful question that you see embodied in uh, the African diaspora, especially. So once upon a time um, in the 19th century, I believe you start to see, and there's a wonderful uh, doctoral student or who might be a doctorate now, Dr. Forbes, who does really fantastic work on Congo arts as well. There's um, a, a fascinating legacy of broken glass and mirror fragments being used at times to honor the deceased on burial grounds. And the understanding is if these mirrors are a portal to the other realm, it's very appropriate to use them on cemetery stones as a way of contacting the spirits because uh, this is a way of relaying messages from one side to the other. And this is something that you see amazingly still in the United States today. So African-American burial grounds, particularly in the U.S. South, and Greg Gundaker does wonderful work on this. Um, there's tin foil that may be placed on grave sites or broken mirrors, bottles that reflect the light um, that hang from trees. These are all examples of what Robert Ferris Thompson refers to as a flash of the spirit, meaning a message is being conveyed to the other side. And so you 
do see it um, to a certain extent on burial grounds, but I find that it's even more common to a certain extent in the African diaspora rather than in Congo still today. Thank you. Um, let's see, I don't think we have anything else in the chat. Am I, I'm looking around for hands. Does anybody else have a question? I'm not seeing, I don't wanna overlook anyone, but oh, I do, John Maholchek, I think you have your hand up. You're muted still. Still muted, John. There we go. Okay, John. yes, I'm sorry. No um, I missed the first part of the presentation. I had some guests. Uh, you know, the, one of the last images you showed was the Haitian altar. And mm -hmm. uh, the center, of course, was the Madonna and Child. but. All of the other religious objects there uh, probably are Haitian. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, is this linked with uh, uh, Santeria of, say, Cuba, Brazil? And does it come from uh, Africa or does it come from uh, places like uh, Latin America? Thank you for that question, Dr. Mahalchek. It's great to have you join us. Um, yes, Cuban Santeria, also known as Lukumi, Brazilian Candomblé, and Haitian Vodou, we can consider all of them to be sister traditions, if you will, or part of the Africana religious network. They have very deep roots in West African religious traditions with certain lineages in, for instance, Lukumi or Santaria of Cuba, you have a more prominent Yoruba focus in the religious tradition. And so in fact, many of the spirits are recognized as Orisha in Nigeria, so specifically Yoruba land in Nigeria, are still recognized by the same name in Cuba today. Haitian Vodou is really unique in that there was a blend of uh, Congo, Yoruba, and also Fon Benin traditions from West and Central Africa. And so while you do have these multiple uh, lineages, there are really what created uh, Haitian Vodou was a synthesis of these different religious traditions from West Africa and from Central Africa. So there are certain spirits that are more Congolese. I mentioned the Simbi spirit, for instance. There are other spirits that are more Yoruba, like Ogu. Then there are spirits that are more from Dahomey and from Benin, like Dambala. Now, to your point about the Madonna, that's an excellent point. Of course, this is a tradition that encountered uh, Catholicism not only as a colonial repressive force under French colonialism, but also because the ancient Congo kingdom converted to Catholicism in 1509 under King Afonso, you have a blending of Congolese religions and Catholicism happening on the continent itself. So there's all of these mixtures that are taking place and that are, that are then brought to the Americas. Um, so very much sister tradition. And I'll note here that there are some sacred objects that you might observe that have mirrors on them. This is because the tradition of mirrors as a sort of flash of the spirit maintains a strong prominence in Haitian sacred arts as well. And this is something that Professor Elizabeth McAllister has written about. She's written about the beautiful and powerful mystique uh, of bouté of sacred bottles, including those that have mirrors on them as ways of connecting with this crossroads between visible and invisible realms. You know, I also noticed, you know, on the uh, image of the person standing with uplifted arms to the left of the Madonna as we face it, Mm -hmm. is in a very statuesque Orantes position. And that you know, goes all the way back to you know, biblical times. Mm. So I, you know, that link of you know, almost an eclectic gathering of religions and spirits you know, is very fascinating to me. 
Yes, very much so. And that is an example of a particular type of packet Congo or a particular type of healing bundle that is used in Haiti. It is um, includes a portrait of the Black Madonna here, um, but also that is representative of three horns, which you see in certain spirits known as Bosu in Haiti or Tohosu in Benin and Font traditions of West Africa. So thank you so much, Dr. Mahalchek. Okay, that's very fascinating. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this is from Saran Yared. Another um, student of mine. Oh, good. <laughs> We're always happy when we have students in the audience, especially asking questions. Um, good, so wonderful presentation. Earlier in the talk, you mentioned that the mirror can often give the individual visions or a view of their ancestors. In that same sense, how can these forms of divination, et cetera, link those separated from the motherland to the African diaspora? Oh, wonderful question, Saron. Thank you so much for posing this. I will say that I think really this is the power of examining African diaspora traditions as reinterpreted and reimagined African ritual arts traditions. When I say what I mean that this is a perfect example, you have a healing bundle that actually looks somewhat similar to certain styles of Minkisi, not the ones with the nails, but other styles of Minkisi as ritual art objects. It includes the mirror, it includes feathers as ways of contacting the divine. Um, to Dr. McAllister's question, yes, they can be fed. Usually they're fed with palm wine and they're baptized with fire. Um, and so Saron, to your question of, you know, can this be a way of connecting? I think that people who are involved in African diasporic traditions feel very strongly that this is a way of honoring their ancestors. It is not something that they do lightly. They are very aware of the fact that these religious traditions were persecuted, continue to be persecuted today in the 21st century, especially by Pentecostal and evangelical communities. Um, we continue to be blamed for practicing these religious traditions as if they are the cause of our problems. Pat Robertson in 2010 mentioned that the Haitian earthquake was the direct result of Haitians pact with the devil. And I mentioned that because the earthquake that has just happened in 2021, we've seen him very silent. You know, I understand that there are many ways in which these prejudices persist. And so by choosing to be involved in these African diasporic traditions or African traditions, people sometimes belong to traditions that they are not necessarily, you know, raised in because they find it an, a mode of empowerment. They find it a mode of, of honoring the ancestors whose names we know and whose names we do not know. And so I think that there are a lot of ways that belonging to these traditions or studying these traditions really grant us access to the different ways that these are tools of empowerment and you know ritual technologies if you will that provide access to the other side of the world wow well that that sounds like a really good note to end on really thinking about how these are such active practices and how it's we can't siphon off or um, silo off religion into one area and um, politics into another, um, but how they're all intertwined and how powerful um, these sacred rituals and objects are. Um, I did notice too, somebody in the chat mentioned that they're very excited to read your book and to read about the other chapters. This was such a rich talk and a rich chapter that I'm just, um, I can't wait to be able to read all of them together um, and to learn so much more from you. So. It just remains for me to thank Professor Daniels once again for this really wonderful talk. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for joining. Again, special thanks to you all for joining on a Monday afternoon, Monday evening. Special thanks to my family and to all my brilliant students. Great so, to see everyone. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.